This is Love Your Work, and I'm David Cadavy. If you had asked me when I first started Love Your Work why I was doing it, I don't think I could have given you a straight answer. I simply felt compelled to create a podcast. And sometimes it's through the act of creation that we discover what it is that we're creating. This is a special 200th episode of Love Your Work. 200. Over the past four years, I've been on my own creative journey in making this show. Today, I want to reflect on that journey. I want to share what I've learned along the way, and hopefully that will reflect some of what you've learned along the way. I didn't know for sure why I was starting Love Your Work when I first started, but if you were to ask me now why I started Love Your Work, I'd tell you that it's probably because I was struggling with a conflict. It's a conflict that you might struggle with yourself. On one side of the conflict is who you are expected to be. On the other side of the conflict is who you really are. The process of self-actualization, the process of making it, is a process of becoming that person who you really are through your creative work. So in the first episodes, I defined Love Your Work as a place where you can learn to carve out success by your own definition, is the way that I put it. I wanted to talk to people who had found their own unique ways of doing things. And I hoped that through talking to enough of those people, I too would find my own way of doing things. So in my mind, there was no better example of doing things your own way than Jason Freed. Jason has done things his own way every step of his career. He created an extremely simple project management app called Basecamp, which has been in business for more than 15 years now. He's resisted feature creep the whole time. He's written a number of books on unconventional approaches to work, including It Doesn't Have to Be Crazy at Work and Rework. But Jason wasn't always so confident in his own way of doing things. If you listened to our special 100th episode, 100 episodes ago, on how to find your calling, you've heard this clip before. And yes, I'm using it again, even as the very first clip of this special 200th episode. It is that good. When Jason was first starting out as a freelancer, he too struggled to find the courage to do things his own way. What he learned set the pace for the rest of his career. Here he is on the very first episode of the show, and you can tell by my reaction, I knew I had hit pay dirt. I was doing these long proposals, and because um, I thought that's what you had to do, like 20-page proposals. I remember like writing 20-page proposals about like- Oh, yeah, I've done a couple of Right, those. right? Yeah. And you spend, I don't know, weeks and all-nighters, and like you write these proposals. You don't get the job. You don't get the job, right? <laughs> so I realized this. I'm like, you know, I'm doing these 20-page proposals. I'm busting my ass on them. I don't like doing them. It's what you're supposed to do, right? Or is it? So I started doing shorter and shorter and shorter proposals and started winning jobs. Mm. And um, at the end of my freelance career, I was doing single page proposals. Yeah. And I wasn't losing any business over them. And I realized, holy shit, I don't need to do what everyone else is doing. Like, I thought this is how you had to do it, but you don't have to do it that way. And that's like where I gave myself permission to go, well, what else don't I have to do that everybody else is doing? Okay. I found exactly what I was looking for in that conversation. Did someone with such a unique approach as Jason has ever struggle himself to do things his own way? Jason thought he had to do long proposals, but it turned out he could do short proposals. Even Jason Freed had a moment where he did things the way everyone else did. And my talk with Jason was inspiring, but I couldn't always relate to the end goal that Jason was achieving. Jason runs a software company with a fair amount of employees. He's got a big office in Chicago. I knew I didn't want to run a software company. I knew I didn't want a big office in Chicago. But then I talked to Saya Hillman. Saya is founder of Mac and Cheese Productions. Now, what do you think a company with a name like that does? It turns out that they do a lot of things. And Saya shared the story of how she started one of her first big events. I really wanted to be a 
Broadway star, but I do not have any of the skills. So um, I decided I should concoct a situation where I could get a paying audience to give me a standing ovation for my lack of ability. And I was like, well, no one is in the pay to see me do any of this stuff by myself, but they might pay to see a group of people. And I said, this is, uh, this is what I propose that I will uh, rent a dance studio. I will hire a choreographer. Uh, we will look for a theater. We will attempt to sell tickets. So I did all that and I uh, sent an email to probably 50 friends of mine who I thought would not be absolutely aghast at this idea. Uh, and uh, of those 50 friends, I ended up selecting 16 people who I knew, but they didn't know each other. And uh, we rehearsed for three months and we're like, all right, let's sell tickets. We'll see if we can sell 10, 50. We ended up selling out uh, 350 people. No, I didn't want to rent a theater and put on a production like Saya did. But I did love the idea of building your business around the activities that you want to be doing. Saya has found ways to get paid for wearing pajamas, playing board games, camping. Here I was doing this podcast and writing. But was I really leaning into the activities that I wanted to be doing to the way that I wanted to fill my time and my day? This is something that I thought about more while on a retreat with some friends in Mexico. And we spent the whole week going over our directions and our lives and our careers. And it was a long process. It took that whole week for me to really admit to myself what it was that I wanted. I was reluctant to even say it out loud because once I did say it out loud, there was no going back. I said, I just want to read about the things that interest me, have conversations, use it all to inform my understanding of the world, and share what I've learned. Within three weeks, I was on a plane to Colombia. I wanted to double down on writing and podcasting and doing all the reading that I needed to do in order to write and podcast. I reduced my possessions down to a few suitcases. I gave up my apartment in Chicago. I chose to live in Medellin because it was the perfect place to build the routines I wanted to build. Their weather is always perfect. It's called the city of the eternal spring for a reason. The culture is laid back and it was much cheaper than Chicago. If I was going to make it as a writer, I was going to need some financial runway. I even rented a furnished apartment so that I could make my day-to-day -day life easier. Now I had nothing in my way. I was ready to create. And each day I got up. And I wrote, I started to build a writing habit and I kept it up. And within three months, I had a book proposal ready and I had a list of agents who I knew would love my book. I composed pitch emails. I attached the proposal. I sat back and I relaxed. Any day now, my work would pay off. Any day now, I'd be signing a high five figure book deal. But the responses didn't come. The responses that did come were lukewarm. So I revised the proposal. Again, it wasn't a winner. I revised it again, and the same result. By now, I had been in Medellin for almost a year and a half. I had completely redesigned my life around writing and podcasting, but I was still failing as a writer and podcaster. Even living in Colombia, my bank account was starting to dwindle. I had done a ton of writing and podcasting, but I didn't have a book deal. I felt as if I had nothing to show for it. And then I talked to Seth Godin. My point is, you can't cede this authority to a publisher because they're not gonna do a good job. Even if they care about you, they have to do a book every two days. So you're still going to be the head of marketing for your book. You're still going to be the head of, of strategy for your book. So how do you learn that? Well, you learn it by doing it. And the easiest way to do it, do it under another name if you want, is to come out with a book a week on the Kindle, to figure out how to build websites that get people to click and sign up to figure. I mean, it costs nothing to do this. It costs less than it costs me to mail my proposals to book packagers, to book publishers. So what are you waiting for? 
that this moment, there's all this milling about and sometimes someone raises their hand and say, yeah, I'm over here. And that act, you know, you're showing up every day doing a podcast. It's an extraordinarily generous act. There's not a short line between here and success. There is a long line and you're on it, but you're learning every time you do it. How much does it cost you to start doing a podcast? Nothing, right? But there's all these other people who are waiting for Podcasting Central to call them on the phone and say, will you please do a podcast? And no one's going to call. Seth's words flipped a switch in me. Moving to Columbia to become a writer was a bold move. It was a rare moment of courage when I ignored what others expected me to do and instead did what I felt in my bones that I needed to do. But I was back in that same conflict again. I was seeking the approval of others when I didn't need their approval. I was looking for permission to do something I didn't need permission to do. And what publisher would want to offer me a book deal anyway if I hadn't already proven that I knew how to write and market a book people wanted to buy? Sure, I had some experience with that with my first book designed for hackers, but now I was switching genres. I was learning how lucky I had gotten with my first book deal. I was learning that just because I had success in one genre, that did not mean automatic success in another genre. And did I need to fit a genre at all? Even if I could get approval from a traditional publisher again, is that something I would want? This is what I wondered after I talked to John Bokenkamp. It's easy to forget that John Bokenkamp ever struggled. After all, he has a long-running primetime television show that he created on NBC. The Blacklist is now beginning its sixth season. But there was a time when The Blacklist's main character, Raymond Reddington, didn't exist. Before James Spader could start flying all over the world on a private jet, tipping off the FBI on one criminal after another, John Bokenkamp had to create that character in his own mind. How did John start with nothing? He was just a Nebraska kid with a Hollywood dream. There were lots of career routes he could have taken in Hollywood. He could have spent his time writing for someone else's show, doing what someone else wanted him to do. But that's not what John did. John spent years in Los Angeles, getting up each day to write. He kept banker's hours, as he called it. At the end of that working day, he started another working day. He spent his night waiting tables at the old spaghetti factory. When I wasn't recording, I told John about my venture down to Columbia, how I was just trying to figure out my own way of doing things. He told me, with a sense of wistfulness in his voice, that's the way to do it. Fortunately, the rest of his golden advice, I did catch on tape. The thing that is unique about writing and the thing that I love about it is that no matter who you are, you really are the only person with that voice. And that is the thing to, you know, really lean into, whether it's weird or whatever it is, just, and it took me a long time, it took me 20 years to figure that out. Like, you know what, I'm going to do my thing. That's the one thing nobody else can, can do. And that's the only thing that people in Hollywood want is originality. Between Seth Godin urging me to learn by doing, and John Bokenkamp inspiring me to find my own voice, it was finally time to self-publish. I had spent years trying to come up with the right book idea. I had started and abandoned countless drafts, but now something was different. Six years after releasing my first book, it was time to finally make the second book happen. It was time to stop procrastinating and start creating. It was time to find the heart to start. I sat down to write, and all of the struggles I ever experienced in creating came flooding back to me. After six years of delaying, within six weeks, I had a completed book. Just before my second anniversary of moving to Medellin to become a writer, I launched The Heart to Start. Ever since then, it's been my own personal handbook for breaking through resistance to get started. Releasing my self-published book, Into the Wild, was a huge breakthrough. A world of possibility opened up to me. I suddenly realized 
anything I wanted to create, I could create it. I didn't have to wait for anyone to pick me, but something was still off. It felt amazing to get my work out there, but I still found myself hesitating. I had more ideas than I knew what to do with, but I didn't feel like I had the time to pursue them. Sound familiar? I would soon realize that it wasn't so much that I didn't have the time. No, it was that I didn't have the energy to pursue all the ideas I had. And the reason I didn't have the energy was because what energy I did have was going to waste. This realization came as I was talking to HR consultant Cy Wakeman. Her book, No Ego, is all about reducing what she calls emotional waste. And I grew up as a therapist, um, was my first career, and I would watch people use really poor mental processes and create so much waste in their lives. But it was emotional waste. It was drama. It was worrying and venting and judging and, you know, doubting and just all of the things that we do when we start believing our own thinking. And so I came across the idea if drama is emotional waste, then the way you get rid of waste is a good process. The way you get rid of emotional waste is with using better mental processes. In my own book, The Heart to Start, I have a chapter about why your ego fears your art. Creating is a process of self-actualization. Your true self comes out in the process of creating your work. But your ego is there all along, protecting that true self. I had grown closer to being that true self by self-publishing. But the realization that I could publish a book without anybody's approval revealed yet another barrier, where ego held me back. It was a poor mental process. I still had old ideas about what a book was. That sounds silly. Obviously, we know what a book is. It's a bunch of pages with words on it. Or is it? I came to realize that books didn't have to be a certain length, that a book is really an encapsulation of an idea. Sometimes it takes 400 pages to encapsulate that idea, but it doesn't have to. Thinking a book has to be a certain length is an old idea about what a book is. That old idea is bolstered by the ego. Don't break the rules of an industry that's hundreds of years old. Don't be weird. People will laugh at you. It was emotional waste. It was a conflict between ego and self that was causing me to second-guess myself. And so, I ignored what my ego had to say about the matter. With shaking knees, I published one short read called How to Write a Book. It's only 7,000 words, maybe 35 pages. Then I published another short read, this time about the cryptocurrency, Steam. It took me six years before I published my second book. Now I had four books, which means that after waiting six years to publish my second book, I published three books in only six months. And best of all, these little short reads were doing well. In some months, I made more money selling How to Write a Book than I did with my full-length book, The Heart to Start. I had finally hit my stride as a creator. I had habits and routines set up. I was loving my life in Columbia, and I had lots more book ideas to publish. But then... It was your average beautiful day in Medellin. From my desk perched in a co-working space, I gazed out at the sun setting over the lush green mountains scattered with terracotta-colored apartment buildings. Then, I got an email. It was my immigration lawyer. I needed to leave Colombia. It had been a routine process. I invested a good portion of my savings in a Colombian company. That investment qualified me for a visa. It's simple, really. Countries want foreigners to invest in local businesses, meet those investment requirements, and you get to stay in the country. But my visa was rejected. Nobody knew why. Nobody could explain it. The government wouldn't say. It was just a one in thousands freak occurrence. Lawyer after lawyer told me, you won the lottery. I'm sorry. I still had my investment, but I didn't have a visa to go with that investment. As I packed up my things, wondering if I would be allowed back into the country, 
I wondered if I had made a big mistake. I had given up so much to go down this path, and I couldn't see any way of going back. But then I talked to Tynan. Tynan lives an incredibly interesting life. He owns property all over the world, jointly with his friends, including a private island. And he's done this with a pretty modest amount of money. Tynan reminded me the importance of following crazy ideas. What I find are that there are a lot of situations, not just for me, but for, for people I coach, for friends, for, you know, for family members, where you get into a situation where the upside is really, really big, maybe life-changing, and the downside is limited and really not that bad. Because a lot of the times what's holding people back from doing it is that something feels like, you know, a all capital big deal. And that's only, you know, but it's not really a big deal. A lot of these things feel like big deals because maybe, you know, because there is that potential of upside and that makes it feel like there's some gravity to it. But then when you think about what's the actual downside if it all goes haywire, it's often pretty small. Moving to Colombia to become a writer was certainly a crazy idea. There was a lot of upside to it. It already had given me a lot of creative freedom. If I could finally make it, that would be priceless. But my visa problems got worse and worse. Just when I thought it was fixed, something would come up. An official would mess something up, or I'd misunderstand a rule. I was able to return and stay in the country as a tourist, but my days were limited. I ended up taking a total of five unplanned trips out of the country just to stay legal. At one point, I found myself changing my clothes in a dirty bathroom of a laundromat in Chicago. How did I end up here? I asked myself. Well, it was because of my visa troubles. After an emergency trip out of the country, I arrived at an Airbnb that was visibly crawling with bed bugs. I had to spend the next 24 hours disinfecting everything I had with me. I had to cancel a meetup I had scheduled with listeners. I had to put all of my clothes in an industrial strength dryer. And that meant I needed to disinfect the clothes I was wearing too, which is why I was changing my clothes in a dirty laundromat in Chicago. Out of the whole visa debacle, this was my lowest moment. This is where I really wondered if I would make it out of all of this alive. It felt as if God or the universe or randomness was trying to kill me. And that's when I realized that I had chosen these problems, not these specific problems, but I had made decisions that increased the likelihood that I would find myself in a situation like this. And as terrible as it felt, I could survive this. And that's when I thought back to my conversation with economist Tyler Cowen. He told me that many people choose to live a very comfortable life. Instead of being dynamic, as he calls it, they are stagnant. By being afraid of risk, they hold themselves back from growth. I think of dynamic as a situation where there is change. You are producing more value for your users or consumers. In some, but not all cases, you're also earning higher income. And you're changing how other people do their business or teach their material or communicate their ideas. That's dynamic. Why do you think that people uh, avoid being dynamic? Well, it involves risk. You have to put yourself out there. I don't even think monetary risk is the main problem. It's that people are afraid to fail. People don't always like feedback. If you fail, or in fact, even if you succeed, the world tells you everything that's wrong with you. For some people, that's tough to deal with. It's important to develop a thick skin, especially in an age of social media. And, you know, accept your own failures and limitations. Look yourself in the eye, figure out what you're good at, not good at, and deal with it. I think dynamic uh, sectors or industries or companies, they're less fragile because they develop the ability to adapt and to change. So things never go according to your plan. And if all you have on your side is stasis, I mean, someone else will be dynamic and beat you. So is it that um, w one reason that people avoid being dynamic is that they are exposed to failure, they are exposed to criticism, and that creates a sense of loss aversion um, that makes them think that they're actually harming themselves when, in fact, it's a, 
it's an instance of anti-fragility where those exposures to these stressors are actually uh, improving their work and what it contributes to the world. Exactly. My year of visa troubles was a bad experience. I wouldn't wish it upon anybody. After the bed bug incident, I was so beaten down that I went to Phoenix. I needed to spend the remaining six weeks of the year outside of Columbia. And I passed that time living with my parents in a retirement community at the age of 39. Yeah, it was that bad. But these visa troubles did change something inside of me. It brought me a little bit closer to self-actualization because it made me less afraid of being myself. When you've spent the past year just trying to stay on the soil on which you stand, you care a lot less about what other people think you should be like. Like Tyler Cowen suggested, I was developing a thicker skin. Throughout all of this, I was still working on my next major book. But along the way, I felt tempted to go for the sure thing. When you go for the sure thing, you aren't yourself. Instead, you make something like someone else has already made. You make something you know some people will want, even if it's not that interesting. And that is tempting to do when your whole life is in limbo. When your creative energy is getting sucked up by trying to find soil to stand on and your money is getting sucked up by trying to find a roof to put over your head. But I got one last push. Again, this push was from Seth Godin. When Seth and I connected for a second time, it had been two years since our first conversation, the one that gave me the courage to self-publish in the first place. In between these two conversations, I had had my self-publishing epiphany. And in the highlight of my year, Seth Godin recommended my book, The Heart to Start, on his blog. That brought a huge spike and it had a lasting lift in sales, but still, it wasn't enough for me to feel like I had made it. It was more like the difference between total failure and modest success. I was selling more books, but it still took ads to sell those books. I was making very little profit off of my books. But Seth gave me some very direct advice. He told me not to place too much emphasis on merely achieving modest success. Your last book was really juicy. Your last book did not sell a million copies. Those things are not completely related, but it's very important that your next book not be something that you think fits into a juicy slot, not be something that is searched for from an SEO point of view. That is not how bestsellers are made. They are made every time by being idiosyncratic. All bestsellers are surprise bestsellers. They come out of nowhere. They are not like hardware, right? They're not like, oh, lots of people are buying spoons. I'll make a spoon, right? That's how you become a second-rate romance novelist. It's not how you write The Martian. The Martian is a bestseller, not because people were searching for Martian. It's a bestseller because he got 200 people to read it. And those 200 people couldn't go to bed last night until they told 10 people each to go read The Martian. That's the book you got to write. Seth's advice came at the right time. My visa problems were just starting to clear up. His words helped me get back on track to make my next book the book that I find interesting instead of merely what I think will be a safe bet. And I got back into my writing rhythm. And as I went to bed one night, I reflected on all it took to get here. The failures, the rejections, the year of visa struggles. With three and a half years behind me, I looked forward excitedly to three more years of bliss. I had just secured a three-year visa after all. And as I laid down in bed that night, I said to myself, I love this life. I literally said that out loud. I love this life. But my world was about to be turned upside down once again. And this time, it was so much worse. The 
the next morning was great. I had the best writing session I had had since before my visa troubles started more than a year prior. I was gaining real momentum on writing my next book. And after a morning of writing, I walked into my kitchen to cook myself lunch and I picked up my phone for the first time of the day and looked at it. And that phone may as well have been a bomb because what I saw there sent figurative shrapnel flying everywhere. Within two hours, my suitcase was packed and I was rushing up the winding roads of the Andean foothills in a taxi. I arrived at the airport with barely enough time to buy a plane ticket at the counter for the last flight of the day. It was another emergency trip. This time, I didn't need to leave where I was. This time, I needed to go somewhere I was not. By the time I got to Phoenix, she was in the ICU. There were tubes everywhere, coming from her arm, snaking out of her throat, and one final tube protruding from the top of her skull. I had just talked to her two nights ago, and she was fine. My mother had suffered a brain hemorrhage. She went into a deep coma almost immediately. Myself and the rest of my family, we waited by her bedside. Now I had a new routine. Wake up in the morning, drive to the hospital, walk across the parking lot, in 117 degree heat wait for a response go home at night and come back to do it again and again and again eventually it was clear mom was not going to wake up there was too much damage to her brain stem we talked to the organ donation people they needed time to prepare so we made an appointment an appointment to remove my mother from life support. On July 13th, I held my mom's hand as her heart beat for the last time. That emergency trip to the airport turned into a two-month mini-life in Scottsdale. We're still surveying the damage and picking up the pieces. And when you're grieving, you simply don't have as much creative energy as you normally would, not to mention that there are arrangements to make and paperwork to review and surviving family members to support. But I still did what I could. I shrunk my writing habit, but still kept writing. Thanks to systems and processes I had in place, the small team that I've built, I was still able to keep this podcast coming each week. I mean, in the end, when your mom is dying, who cares if your podcast is on schedule? But Having this fall apart, too, would have made this experience even more disorientating and deflating. My repeated visa troubles, it turned out, served as a test scenario to keep things running even when your world is in chaos. And those six weeks that I got to spend with my mother because I landed in an Airbnb full of bedbugs, those six weeks have taken on a new meaning. I'm back in Colombia now, but I'll be making more trips to Arizona to spend time with family. I'm still searching for that feeling of having made it. I guess it's like Austin Kleon told me, you never really do make it. Whatever plan you have for how things are going to turn out, something else will happen. Like Tyler Cowen said, things don't go as planned. I should know by now. That is the plan. The best you can do, I guess, is to be ready. Cultivate mental and emotional resilience. Design your systems to withstand chaos. Be anti-fragile. And I still ask myself every week whether it's time to quit this podcast. Has it run its course? I think that's a healthy thing to ask, whatever you're doing. But I always end up concluding that I'm grateful to have Love Your Work And I'm grateful to have you listening. Throughout my journey, this podcast has given me an opportunity to reach out to someone and to get some advice. It always gives me a new perspective. I hope it does the same for you. And I'm seeing that no matter where I have to go, 
No matter what I have to do, no matter what surprises come my way, I'm still somehow compelled to do this work, to improve my understanding of the world and of life and to share what I learn along the way. I guess that's proof that I really do love this work. Thank you for being with me over the last four years through 200 episodes. It's interesting that you think that uh, you recall your childhood memory is that you were forced to make your bed, but uh, I don't remember that. Maybe it's just one of those mundane things that moms have kids do and yeah, you just do it and it yeah. happens. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Great. I think we got, we got some good stuff here. Um, can, can, okay. you just, can you just quickly say um, I, I'm David's mother? I'm David's mother. Again? I'm David's mother. A different way? I'm David's mother. Cool. I think we've got enough. Awesome. All right. Uh, and I'm still David and I'm still David's mother. Thank you to Kevin McLeod of Incompetech.com for the music in this episode. Freely available through Creative Commons. Is Love Your Work helping you find your unique creative voice? Does it bring you the inspiration and motivation you need to become the creator and human you want to be? If so, please be a part of making this a special and nourishing and thoughtful show. Support the show on Patreon. You'll be an even bigger part of this show than you already are. If you contribute just a coffee a month, you'll be helping support the hosting and production of Love Your Work. Everyone has some unique creative gift to offer the world. Together, we can give people the tools they need to bring that work into the world. The world will be better off for it. Visit our Patreon page at patreon.com slash This is a different kind of model for supporting the work that you love. The choice is yours. Vote with your dollars, put your money where your mind is, and keep Love Your Work going. Visit our Patreon page at patreon.com slash As a thank you, you'll get early access, bonus content, and a discount on Love Your Work merchandise. Learn more at patreon.com slash cadavy. That's patreon.com slash K-A, D as in David, A, V as in Victor, Y. And if you can't support the show financially and you've listened to at least three episodes, can you do me a favor? Write a review on Apple Podcasts. You can consider it your donation to help support the show. Love Your Work is brought to you in part by our Patreon supporters, such as mini sponsor Paula Spriggs and top supporters such as Jeffrey Mason and Vitas Pankovicius. This has been Love Your Work, and I'm David Cadavy. The theme music for this show is At Sea by Dorena from the album About Everything and More by arrangement with Deep Elm Records at deepelm.com. Love Your Work is a production of Cadavy, Inc. <laughs>